Akra Maki, and good evening for all of the participants from Indonesia. Uh, thank you for joining with us. So uh, today we have uh, an honor to have uh, Professor Kaneta Kamaki. Uh, I know him in APES 21. Uh, he have a good thing to share in APES 21 workshop. So I think it must be so fruitful if we have uh, many information from Waseda Business School, especially because uh, just like uh, Pak Tantowi said, we have no relation right now with Waseda Business School. Is that so, Pak Tantowi? So, uh, I checked the CIFOL, we have no current collaboration. Okay. So I hope that it's not uh, the last time that we will meet uh, Professor Maki. So we hope we hope that we will have another discussion, meeting, join uh, research, uh, join collaboration in many things. Uh, so I hope we can still discuss for another agenda in 2022. Uh, based on the title, the theme that you suggest, it's uh, very interesting for us to know because some of my colleagues ask me about what is star scientist? Is it about academic that uh, become celebrity or what? <laughs> because star mean uh, they have something in their mind is a celebrity thing. So it, is it uh, academic who become celebrity, who come out uh, to the social media or what? So I think the important thing is uh, we have to know about what is a star scientist and how to develop this star scientist. So I hope that we can learn uh, from you in Japan and then maybe we can accommodate in our uh, campus. Thank you. Uh, hopefully that uh, we can learn each other and hopefully that you can come to Indonesia, go to Bali, to Jogja and uh, just contact us if you go to Surabaya. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Kanitaka Maki. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Kanjar, for your wonderful opening remarks. So I, I will uh, give some short uh, introduction about uh, the, the background of Professor Maki. Uh, uh, Professor Maki research interest in four fields of socioeconomics, of innovation and entrepreneurship, science policy, and university industry technology transfer. He has, uh, yes, he has three streams of research contribution. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Prof. Maki. So the first one would be the institutional design of entrepreneurship at research university. And the second one, methods to improve startup success rates and the quantitative research of innovation system, particularly comparing the US and Japan. Professor Marquis also served as a principal investigator for DST Ristex Star Scientists and Innovation in Japan project. The project promotes the advance of science, technology, and innovation in Japan, optimize and effective allocation of research grant is becoming increasingly critical nowadays. Uh, for the attendance and all the participants, please make sure you put your microphone off and video on at the delivery session. We also encourage you to participate in the discussion actively. And please send your questions to the Zoom chat or raise your hand to us directly at the end of the session. It would be question and answer session. Without further ado, please, Professor Mikey, the session is yours. Okay, great. So thank you very much for a kind uh, introduction. And thank you very, very much for having me here to be a speaker today. And yes, as uh, you mentioned, definitely this is a start of our collaboration. So I really look forward for, you know, future collaborations based on my talk, my talk or, you know, any of the topics related to entrepreneurship and innovation, like uh, of business school, let's say. So today I'm going to talk about, by the way, everybody can see the, uh, my PowerPoint, right? And everybody can see my, uh, I can combine with my video, but I think it's easier to stick with this one. So everybody can see my face and the uh, PowerPoint, right? And if you can put your video camera on, uh, please do so because 
when you nod or you and you're smiling, that is a great feedback for me to be more engaged and more passionate to talk about. It's your responsibility to make me passionate as well. It's a mutual <laughs> collaboration. As in IT is in a business school, so you know, I always facilitate lots of discussions. So uh, thank you very much for you know people who and yeah, if you have some reasons you cannot put on the video, that video that's fine, but please just use the chat window as well. So today's topic from a researcher to a star scientist, lesson learned from Japan. And my name is Kaneta Kamaki, and I'm an associate professor at Waseda Business School, which is one of the top uh, university, private university in Japan. So this is uh, my background a little bit. So I currently at, uh, uh, teaching at uh, Waseda Business School, and I teach like, entrepreneurship and technology management. And also, I got my PhD at UC San Diego, uh, like uh, six years ago or so. And I also teach at UC San Diego during summertime. As you can guess, you know, Tokyo is not the best place to stay during the, in, in August. It's too hot and too humid. So I try to escape to going to California every summer and teach there as well. So I have a joint appointment, both in Waseda as well as UC San Diego. Then uh, after I got my PhD, I was at Stanford as well uh, as a researcher. So I have like experience in uh, uh, studying about the ecosystem of like a Silicon Valley and so on. Then prior to that, before I going to the US, I was at the Keio University, which is a private university in Japan. And I was in charge of a university-based incubation, like a supporting startup. So my background is uh, connect, uh, it's both in the practice and the academic, as well as Japan and the US. So all of these, you know, my background uh, raised my research interest, which is a university-based startup, as well as a role of the scientist to start new types of businesses. And as uh, already introduced, these are my research streams. I work on like a university institutional design of universities to promote innovation because entrepreneurship, we, you know, university is very important in many ways. Then I also look for like a strategy and management of uh, startups. I look at the entrepreneurship, the companies itself. Then uh, the third topic is called the star scientists, which I mainly talk about. Okay, so let me begin with a little bit talking about the engine of innovation. And uh, since I want to make this uh, session interactive, I want to use uh, chat. So uh, by the way, there's a new English term called chatterfall, which is, please answer to this question. What comes up to your mind when you hear innovation from Japan? What, what comes to your mind? And don't, pl on the, please put this on chat window and don't push the enter button until I say to do so. Is, is this okay? Is this great, everybody? I will ask everybody to put uh, enter the uh, answer at the same time so that you will not be affected by other people's answer. So you have a 30 seconds to think about what comes up to your mind when you hear innovation from Japan? What, what, what would, be, would be a famous one, innovation from Japan? So 30 seconds. I will wait for 30 seconds. Okay, the audience, please type your answers and uh, let uh, Prof. Maki give you the instruction letter. Oh, somebody already uh, started. Okay, uh, chat of I meant to say return together, but it's fine. Car technology, robot, automobile, manga. Yeah, definitely. Okay, everybody, please put, put, uh, press enter and show your results. Okay, car, technology, robot, manga. I think you know, we have 20 of you, so I'm sure there are a few more answers, if you want. Please, uh, all the participants, you can answer. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't mean to force you, but you know, yeah, yeah. I teach at the business school, so I'm, I have to be teaching in interactively. That's you know, how I engage people. And I'm always good at waiting until people respond, usually, but... Anyway, okay, but okay, I, I don't want to force everybody. So, so car technology, robots, manga, you know, uh, great, thank you. And, you know, these could be like a, some of the potential answers, which is like a bullet train, like a Sony's Walkman long time ago, like a mobile phone, gaming industry, automobile, right? These are quite, you know, famous ones from a Japanese, you know, uh, uh, innovation from Japan and the manga and the games as well. However, so we have 
many types of innovations from Japan that I think everybody agrees, right? That's why people are still interested in the Japanese economies in many ways. However, sorry, let me, okay. So th this is a bit a long, a uh, bit, uh, you know, um, old one, I intentionally putting this, but this is the total entrepreneur activities in by country in year 2000. So there, there's a survey called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor and Japan is ranked as 20th among the GEM countries, which means we have so many types of innovations and like a automobile, you know, game, whatever, but still activity level of entrepreneurship has been very low. And the question is, why, right? That, that explains about the uniqueness, pros and cons about the Japanese entrepreneurship. The reason is, so when we think about the characteristics of traditional Japanese system to promote innovation, like, you know, there were, you know, like during like until like 1990s, Japan as number one, Japan was, you know, has been recognized as one of the most efficient and innovative countries, right? So there's a many research stream on that. But like a K2, which is like a group of the com uh, companies or diversification of the, co the companies, like a main bank system, lifelong, uh, lifelong, lifetime uh, employment, seniority system, all these you are uh, recognized as the uh, strengths of the characteristics of Japanese you know, business, which promoted innovation. But all of this only fits to large companies. The source of innovation was from large firms in Japan. All of the example I mentioned already was not from small companies like startups, but from the big companies. So that was a traditional you know, Japanese innovation system, which was a strength. However, after year 2000, Japanese government recognized this as a weakness of Japan. So after that, Japanese government put, uh, put the loss about effort since 1998 around reformation of Japanese innovation system. So like uh, make it easier to start a company more like uh, encouraging a uh, venture capitalist to you know, invest in the startups, uh, making more like a entrepreneurial friendly environment. And you know, the government even helped make a uh, venture capital. So all of this has been worked uh, in Japan. Also, addition to that, starting from around that and 1998, Japanese government decided to make university as source of innovation. Previously, the big firms were more, you know, uh, more this was a, like a research institute of the big firms was a source of innovation. But, you know, government switched to make it more like a, a university to be the center in, in context of open innovation. So like in 1998, uh, like a, there is a technology transfer office from university. So it's made much easier for a company's industry to use the technology from the, uh, from the university. Or like, a, you know, some grants, SBI are supporting the university-based uh, uh, technologies. Or like a Hiranuma plan in 2001, which the Ministry of Economy, uh, Minister, uh, Minister of Economy decided to make 100 university-based startups. Uh, in like three years, that was a big movement. Then you know revision of you know the, uh, TLOs and uh, so on. So there was a big change of law of universities since two uh, year like nineteen ninety eight. So th that's uh, the the shift of how Japan you know reformed the innovation. Then like uh, what's happening right now is. Like a, there are new movements in Japan, like a bigger startup financing and, you know, a lot of like a three companies. And the spy bar here is, well, actually this is one of the companies I supported when I was at Keio University, like at more than 15 years ago. Now it became like one of the unicorns. Then, you know, there are many companies in the global startups and bigger IPOs and, you know, government supports. And the university now has a lot of the venture capital funds 
and the other companies have the corporate venture capitals. And all of these put in the red are university-based startups, university-related. So universities and scientists are becoming a critical factors of entrepreneurship in Japan. So that's what the background, what I'm going to talk about today. I hope this makes sense to everybody. Then that's why I will talk about star scientists uh, today. And let me begin with briefly telling you what is the star scientist. And star, the star scientist theory was originally created by uh, Professor Zakan Derby uh, from the UC Los Angeles. And uh, we, 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 we conduct, so I, my major is a socioeconomics of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. So we look at the scientist uh, and we look at the performance of the scientist. And what we, you know, usually in our field, what we are researchers found is that notable discoveries, the big discoveries are done by very small number of scientists. Not all scientists are good at doing innovation, but very few of them. And uh, we name that kind of a people who, uh, who have a notable discoveries as a star scientist. And they're the best and brightest scientists in the, globally. And they produce more publications, attract more citations and file more patents than others. So that, that's what we found by data. So according to Zach and Darby, the starting you know, research stream of star scientists, they say that, so they looked at 327 most productive scientists in a genetic sequence um, field, so in a life science, basically, before, until 1989. And uh, these are 300 uh, most productive scientists only account for the 0.07% of the whole author of the pool of the articles in that field, and they account 17% of publishing articles. So less than 1% of the scientists actually produce 20% of the academic articles. That's really ex explains the skewed, right? Skewness of the, the field of the, of the scientist performance. Then this is from the US. So what you can see is that the triangle is, the size of triangle is number of the scientists, which is, uh, in that region. Then now the dots are the way the new, new biotech firms were created. So as you can see, there seems to be correlation between number of star scientists and the place where the company biotech firms are launched. We don't know the causal mechanism yet, but at least there's association, correlation between these two. So according to this research, they also looked more details. So they looked relationship between the, those biotech firms and the star scientists. And when they found that co-authorship between the star scientists in the university and the researchers in the company, the new startup, and they looked the number of the co-authored uh, articles. This figure is a bit difficult to uh, read, but in, in the left uh, three columns, if you go to the back, that means like a more, a more collaborative articles. And the, the first uh, column here is that this is a number of the biotech patents. Second is a number of the product in development. Third is a product in the market. So as you can see, more collaboration with star scientists, more patents and more products. So this means there seems to be a positive effect from star scientists to biotech st uh, uh, startups performance. By the way, when, when we talk about this you know, argument, people you know, uh, become skeptical. Is that because of star scientists? Maybe you know, it's not the people, but it could be the top universities like Harvard or Stanford. So they also checked with a co-authorship with the top 120, uh, 112 uh, uh, universities with, with a co-authoring the articles. And what they found is that Yes, there's a, some impact with working with the top universities, but impact working with a star scientist individual is much larger uh, for the performance of a startup. 
So that this explains something, right? Then also, by the way, people tend to think that venture capital funding is most important in like a startups. So they looked at venture capital funding for each region and they found that the impact of a venture capital finance is small in terms of a performance of a startup. So star scientist is more important. So like addition to that, these are like some of the, so these are the biotech firms which went to the public until like year uh, 1990. And 10, uh, so 40% of these companies, star scientists involved as founders. And 70% of these companies co-authored the article with a star scientist. So like a most successful companies seems to have a relationship with star scientists. The famous one is a genetic in the US. So as you can see, when star scientists involved to startups, the performance of a startup would increase. That's according to the pre pre previous research that this explained. The question is, after the star scientist involved with a startup, what happens to the, uh, the performance of a star scientist as a researcher? So that's the next question. So in the previous research, they found that any of the researchers who involve with uh, startups has higher performance of research, academic publication as well. So. Uh, I think uh, you okay. Yeah. okay. Right. So, but you know, this is only the association, right? So, you know, it's, it seems it could be that productive researchers, you know, start a company. So, they also, Zach and Debbie also looked the chronological order. And what they found is after the star science getting involved with a startup, the number of the citations will increase. So, it was because of the, you know, because it was a causal. And then when we make the interview to the star scientists, they say that after working with the startups, they can come up with a more interesting research questions. So they can increase the performance of research. So this is called a virtual circles uh, in science and commerce. So when star scientists work with firms, the firm's performance increase. And because of this, star scientists the performance will increase because of the collaboration with firms. So this is called a virtuous circle because both of them have benefits. Then I have been talking about the phenomena in the US. So the question is, do star scientists only appear in the US? That is a question you know, we want to ask. And I always make this kind of a talk in Japan and where do you think is the second largest uh, country with a star scientist? And then when I ask this in Japan, you know, people say like UK, China, or so on. But yeah, this is, uh, I'm talking about 1980s. What's interesting is Japan was the second in terms of ranking. 12% of star scientists was in Japan. 50% was in the US. However, what's more interesting is that in Japan, star scientists in Japan tends to work with, the number of the collaboration is higher than in the US. Japan, Japan is higher than the US. So Japan had a very unique ecosystem. So, you know, they looked very similar thing, you know, about, you know, the performance of our companies who worked with a star scientist in Japan. And they found the performance of those companies were working as well. So the, the next question is, is this, what's happening? Is this only in the biotech? That's one. And secondly, they, they, all of this data was in 1980s. The question is, what's happening right now in, in Japan? That's what's very really, well, that's made me interested. So, based on that uh, concept, uh, we started project. Before that, I just want to show you some, you know, some more research related, because I think this is important to know. You know, can star scientists educate other scientists? So there are many research streams on this field as well. well what, what's interesting is that star scientist has very high productive research performance. And any of the researchers around star scientist seems to have very high productive you know, papers as well. So this is called the invisible college, which means any of the researchers inside the circle 
or like a square, uh, the boundary of the star scientist seems to be very uh, high performing. And the question is, there, there, there might be two explanations. One is star scientists are good at educating the peers. That's why those peers become like a high performing uh, researchers. That's one. Another explanation is opposite. Those people are very smart from the beginning. That's why they were selected by star scientists to work with. Now that's, you know, that there might be too causal, right? So there is a famous paper in our field called uh, Superstar Extinction. And what they've done is that if this is a science research, what we usually do is a randomize and make a treatment group and control group and make a treatment group, star scientists, ask them, make them to stop doing the research. Then after they stop doing the research and if we compare the, you know, uh, the performance of other researchers, if that they increase, decrease, then we can say it was causal from the star scientists, right? But you know, none of the star scientists are willing to conduct that kind of experiment. They don't want to be part of that experiment. So what's uh, clever about the superstar extinction paper is that they made a list of star scientists. Then they also made the list of the accidental deaths of star scientists. Accidental means exogenous. So you know, it's like a randomized. Then they compare the, uh, the, the um, researchers around them and not around uh, the uh, with, uh, researchers who died uh, close with uh, star scientists who had accidental deaths and compare with uh, the star scientists who didn't uh, have the accidental deaths. And what they found is that after the deaths, all of the performance of the researchers around that star scientist decreased. So they concluded that it was because of a star scientist also makes other researchers high performing. This really explains, this is a very important for science policy in many ways. By the way, there could be a many reasons why, you know, after the accidental death of star scientists made, you know, less performance for the researchers, you know, could be like a providing ideas mentoring, you know, star scientists could be like a gateway matching with other researchers or like, you know, they have more resources, providing resource. Or like, you know, they are usually, usually the editor of the academic journals, so higher probability of accepting the journals or could be like, a, you know, uh, the person who decides the government grants. All of this could be explanation, but they checked all of these reasons uh, by using the, the quant quantitative analysis and they found only the providing ideas and mentoring was working for this uh, session. So that's one. Uh, another thing it's also interesting is that star scientists, is this only by, can we just define this by, you know, their research productivity? Because there are nice star scientists and not nice star scientists, right? So let's say some star scientists are good at educating, but some star scientists just use young researchers as a resource and they don't help. So in other paper, which is the recall sample research, you know, star scientists, uh, they, they redefine star scientists by how helpful they are to other people. And how, how, how can we measure the helpfulness? This was a very interesting because they measured by uh, looking at the acknowledgement of all academic papers. Some, of these, some star scientists often, uh, uh, you know, uh, shows up in acknowledgement of academic papers, or some of them not. Then they made the accident deaths of the accidental deaths of a star scientist. And what they found is that only the researchers who is a high helpfulness. So, uh, so the, in this uh, quadrant, Marvin or Oster, after the death, the performance of the researchers around that person will decrease. So actually the helpfulness was more important than research performance. So I always joke to Japanese, you know, university staffs that we, you know, not joke actually, but when we hire new professors, we shouldn't be just looking at the number of the publications. We should count the number of the acknowledgement. That really helps the spillover of the science research. And that will be the source of startups. So that's another thing. And also one more paper which was very interesting was that science advanced one funeral at a time. This is a very impressive title. 
So when star scientist dies, what happened to the research field that he has been working on? There could be two explanations, right? One is because of the top third died, you know, the, it made that the research field may shrink, it becomes smaller. Another explanation is it's getting bigger. And they looked at all of the deaths of the star scientists. And what they found is that after death of the star scientists, the field actually expands. So star scientists are getting old, they act as like a gatekeeper. And only the, the, the scientists in a invisible college tends to work in a, has a high performance. Any of the researchers outside of that star scientist community has more difficulty to get in. However, after they die, you know, and there will be more freedom for new researchers to join that field. So that makes the expansion, big expansion of that field. So there's a pros and cons of a star scientist, which is interesting. Then, as I said, these phenomena, what's happening right now in Japan, that is my original motivation of our research project. And that's why I started, I became the principal investigator of the JST Tech Star Scientists and Innovation in Japan project. JST is one of the biggest funding agency, government-based uh, funding agency in Japan. So we, in this project, we had the four big uh, topics. One is uh, detecting the star scientists. Then secondly, current status of uh, star scientists in Japan because are they uh, has a positive effect in Japanese you know, companies. And three, as I said, Japanese government decided to make a university as an engine of innovation, not the big firms anymore. So was there any change of role in the star scientist? Then you know, how can we educate a future star scientist? And we've looked, so we made a new list of star scientists of now, the current star scientists globally, including Japan. And we looked their impact of firms. And I, one thing I wanted to explain is that the way to, you know, the, the transfer the technology from uh, university to firms has been rapidly changed. Prior to the uh, reformation of you know, national innovation system in Japan, Japan had a very unique arrangement, which is university in the firms. When they start a joint research, because you know, Japanese universities, top universities was a public university. And in that time, they, it was part of the government. So uh, they were not allowed to have a contract. So the, when they say joint research, it was informal and no contract. Firms send researchers to university and the university researchers and farm researchers work together. They, then, uh, then they publish the uh, academic articles. And the patents, university didn't care that much. So they just gave uh, firms to uh, file a patent on behalf of university. So that was the arrangement from that time. After the reformation, there is a, now the contract and there's a negotiation of a contract between the firm and the university. Then uh, firms pay the, the research budget, and now there's a technology transfer office of the university. So this office licensing a patent to firm and the firms pay the royalty. So it's become more like a legal you know, institute. And that was a big change uh, for Japanese innovation system in many ways. Then. Our project, our JST Risk uh, Star Scientist in Japan project, what we have done is that we created a Star Scientist cohort database, data set. This includes scientific uh, paper database, uh, patents, and also the academic funding from the government, and also the startup companies information. We combined all of these together. And we made a working paper and we made the original star scientist list. This is a very similar to a clarivate analytics, a highly cited researchers. So what we have done is we divided all of researchers into 21 fields, well, actually by, by academic journals, 21. 
then we may made a list of highly cited papers. So by papers, we choose a very, you know, very impactful papers. Then we choose the authors with who has many highly cited papers. That, that is called a highly cited researchers, and we call that as a star scientist. The, 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 there are a few differences from the uh, uh, clarivate analytics highly cited researchers. What, one is that we made a short list and a long list of star scientists. So one is a strict criteria, which is a short list, and we made a less strict criteria, which has more like, you know, because when we analyze, we want to have more star scientists to analyze, and that's why. Uh, and then, so unique openness about what NATO said, this is, is the original definition of star scientists by number of the highly cited papers. We disambiguated the names of star scientists. You know, disambiguation is always a big issue in a quantitative research. Then we have a short list and long list. So we, we have more ways to analyze our you know, researches. Also, we also created a new list, which is a star scientist with an interdisciplinary research field. Traditionally, you know, it was easy to distinguish the difference between, let's say, chemistry and physics. But no, now, no, nowadays, more and more the uh, fields are merging. So interdisciplinary research field is very important. So some researchers, you know, publish both in different fields, right? And in the traditional way of uh, 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 detecting, and detecting. It was, you know, we lose these you know, interdisciplinary researchers. Then they also, what's new about data set is we combine not only academic articles, but, you know, research budget and the startups. We also looked at gender difference because in Japan, still the female researchers are less than male researchers, which is, you know, gender equality is quite important. Then based on this data set, we created a star scientist in Japan in a white paper, 2000. We, are, we look to change by countries, change by research fields, change by organization, and change by time sheet. So this is by countries. This is a list of the 2017 of the, which is the, the, the time we, when we made a star scientist list. So by countries, actually, you know, 20 years ago, the US was 50% and Japan was like 10% of whole star scientists. But the dominance of the US uh, in terms of star scientists is actually increasing. Then second is UK, China, Germany, France, and Japan is like a 10th uh, right now. And in a chronological order, unfortunately, ranking of Japan is decreasing in terms of a number of star scientists which is a, still we have a big number, but which is an issue right now. And when we, when we distinguish the, the, the short list of star scientists, a long list, uh, the, the, the general order is uh, it's same, but when we look at short list, we have 82 star scientists in Japan right now, which is a 12th rank. And uh, in the US, it's uh, more than around 2000. When we uh, think about the long list, which is a wider definition of a star, star scientist. 47, uh, 474 star scientists in Japan and like uh, 9,000 in the US. These are the, the strong research fields in Japan. When we look at the short list, chemistry, immunology, material science, and plant animal science. The, these are the you know, top uh, strong fields in Japan. And then when we look at the long list, chemistry and plants, animal and science. Then, by the way, another thing is that when we look at the by ranking of you know, organization with, uh, in terms of a star scientist, Liken uh, University of Tokyo, NIMS, Osaka University, JSCAC, and Kyoto University, those are the seven. And as you can see, we have lots of government-based organizations, which are the many star scientists. And by the way, when I expand this, you know, ranking to the whole Japan, it's interesting that yes, it, it, only few particular university has a many star scientists. But what's interesting is that there's a much wider spread to 
many regional universities in Japan as well uh, of the distribution of star scientists, which is also uh, interesting. Then we look the number of the startups which was created by star scientists. This is a bit using the older list of our star scientists, but nine star scientists actually started 15 startups uh, after the 2007. So th th this is a quite uh, interesting result uh, in many ways because in the US, star scientists tend to start a company. And after the reformation of Japanese innovation system in Japan, also star scientists tend to start a company like in the US. And it's interesting that many researchers, star scientists create several companies, not only one. So they are becoming like a, becoming like a serial uh, entrepreneurs. I also made a list of the using the new long, long list, which is our new list. Now we have like a, 30 startups, which is on our list. So we, we so the number of these startups founded by star scientists is increasing. Then on the list, yeah, what I found interesting was you know one of the researchers, Professor Masaru Tomita. Uh, actually, I was at the Keio University like uh, before I was going to the US. So I did help a little bit about a startup uh, he created. And uh, Professor Masaru Tomita is uh, one of the uh, science, star scientists list, uh, and he's a bioinformatics researcher. So he's an interdisciplinary uh, IT and uh, biology, you know, combined researchers. And he formed many companies, like eight companies around him. And I found that it's very interesting. And I thought uh, he's uh, like a new type of a uh, model of entrepreneurs in Japan. So I knew him uh, for 20 years. So I decided to make him an interview. And we made a business school case scientist, Masaru Tomita, which focusing on him, how he managed his, his research lab and how he support the startups. And fortunately, Nikkei Shinbun, it's like a Wall Street Journal in Japan, which is the biggest new paper article. They made a article about you know, Masaru Tomita as a star scientist, uh, which you know, we are proposing. And I was part of this interview. And you know, this was a good you know, timing for us to, to, you know, to promote our activities as star scientists and you know, being, uh, increasing the awareness of the star scientists in Japan. By the way, what, according to this interview, what, 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 what we found interesting was previously in the US, the star scientist theory, you know, they say star scientists important and how they involve with star uh, with the startup was like, you know, usually star scientist is becoming like a chief scientist of the company or like sometimes becoming founder or becoming like a part of management team. But what they could explain was knowledge transfer of research was more important. But what I found in the Professor Masaru Tomita's case, which is, you know, the role of the scientist, especially in Japan at least, is changing now. A scientist is not only doing the science research. They're becoming like a more like a producers rather than a traditional scientist role. So like, but in case of a Professor Tomita, he's mentoring his student and uh, encouraging a student to start a company. He's becoming like an advocate of entrepreneur and the recruiting the project member. So he often find a new field that could be interesting and potentially becomes a business. And he, he's good at recruiting a project member. And after the research project will be uh, expanding, those members will start a company. So, you know, a star scientist is been, uh, acting role of the incubating the project, supporting the research project and supporting us starting a company. So, Suruoka case is very interesting because Suruoka is one of the campus, campuses of Keio University, which is a northern part of Japan, which is in a way isolated place. They only had the research institute in the beginning, but only one star scientist went there and he created a new research institute. Now they have like eight startups in biotech 
and they created an ecosystem in a rural area of Japan. So this is a very interesting model in terms of uh, entrepreneurship in Japan. And so the ecosystem, this kind of a science-based ecosystem, which is uh, started by star scientists, is becoming a pretty interesting uh, model uh, in Japan right now. And this is the, the model that used to explain the star scientists of phenomena in the US in context of a national innovation system. But this is what exactly happening in Japan right now as well. So this, this phenomenon is not only in the US. So let me just briefly explain that as a summary. Government provides the uh, subsidies and grants to universities and in the government labs. Then star scientists belong to these universities and star scientists create a new firms by breakthrough technology. And new firms are supported by financial systems like a venture capitalists. Then new firms collaborate with the big firm establishing firms and these new firms create a new industry. And th th this is a you know, mechanism that science-based long lasting you know, startups are you know, created. So where do entrepreneurs come from? You know, they are like a fancy IT service startup in Japan as well. But you know, what's more fundamentally important is a deep tech, you know, science-based research. And this model seems to be becoming global phenomena in many places. Oh, by the way, well, one of the good news is each country does not need to educate because educate the star scientists because migration rate of star scientists is increasing. So what's more important is not to educate star scientists. I mean, star, educating star scientists is yes, is, yes, important, but attracting the one star scientist will really change the, uh, the, the ecosystem of that region. So uh, the, our project, star scientist project, ended uh, last March. And we, you know, this way is uh, some conclusion, tentative conclusion what we found. Virtual circles in science commerce happen uh, in current Japan as well. And star scientists in Japan now, like 20 years ago, they used to work with the big, only big firms because there was no startups in Japan at that time. But now the star scientists prefer to work with more with a startup or like they start a company rather than big firms. And this was a big, uh, you know, uh, impacted by the uh, change of the transformation of the national innovation system. And star scientists in Japan tend to involve with a startup in many different ways. Different, uh, it's quite different from the US in that sense. And the policy and the business implications, we revealed the existence of star scientists in Japan. And it helps the funding agency to select strategic research field of Japan for the future. They also we reveal the existence of virtual circles of science and commerce in Japan, because you know in Japan there was a perception that there is a trade-off between academic research and you know starting a business or like a, starting a you know startup. If you start a company, people feel you should focus more on research. That was a perception. However, virtual circle means if you deal with startup, you will become high performing researchers as well, which is happening in Japan as well. So this sheds a new light on the university policy in Japan. You know, we can encourage uh, university researchers to start a company more with this evidence. And you know, we made a star scientist list. This helps industry sector to find a new innovation partners in academia because you know, they need to help. And you know, collaboration with uh, big firms for star scientists helps you know, uh, increase as well when they started a company. So the, but this helps for the venture capital for the future funding as well. So that's why we are using this star scientist concept. Even now we are trying to, after this research, we are you know, trying to create a new type of accelerator that helps star scientists start a company because that is a mostly one of the efficient ways to you know, create opportunities. 
Okay, so as a, as a ending, you know, our project is, you know, composed by many of the core members uh, from like a groups and many universities. And we have research assistant to deal with making all of these, uh, all of these star science list and analysis. So I would like to appreciate these members as the ending of my talk. And thank you very much. So this is all I prepared as, I think it's exactly 45 minutes, right? So, and thank you very much. So if you have any questions, I'm very happy to talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Monty, for your wonderful delivery. Uh, actually, I have some question, but before me, please, uh, your participants, you can raise your hand and uh, write, uh, deliver your question right now. Uh, maybe before that, Professor Monty, I have specific question about the, the your evidence. So, uh, I, I have an understanding that it's more likely uh, tend to natural and applied science instead of like uh, social uh, science field. Is that true for the current uh, finding? Did you say, so we are focusing more on the social science? Uh, I mean like uh, the evidence of uh, rising in social science field. Uh, so I have an understanding that most of the uh, star scientists is are in natural and applied science is that true okay okay that, that is true so we have a 21 field and uh, two of the fields so social science okay. and and the, the, including like economics and we did not find any star scientist in social science in japan it was zero but when I look at the US, let's say, you know, some of the high performing researchers are in, in a behavior economics researchers. Mm -hmm. And those researchers tend to start a company using their research about behavior economics. And so in the US, social scientists is becoming entrepreneurs as well, but that's not really happening in Japan that much yet. Okay. How about the role of like uh, business incubators and teaching industry in the university for the context of Indonesia? Uh, so far, uh, as I, uh, as far as I understand, most of the business incubators uh, tend to help uh, the students. So, uh, so do you have any recommendation to swift that kind of strategy? I see. So. What I found in the case of uh, Professor Tomita Tsuruoka, they have the science park around them and they have some sort of incubator. But what's more important to the star scientists, not the incubator, because there are many places with incubator with not enough startups coming out. So first, because you know, good, scientist is not attracted by incubators, but att attracted by best scientists, right? By people and people. And those are better way. And in the incubator is only the supplement after there's a good research. Just starting the incubator doesn't help. That's one. Then the second is that globally, helping undergrad student is Good, because you know, uh, you know, fostering entrepreneurship in the younger generation is important as education. So I'm not saying that's not important, but usually the big business comes from like a PhD student or faculty. So we should focus more on that. By the way, you know, Stanford is famous for many of the spin-offs, right? From a spin-off. But you know, people forget that Stanford is the graduate school based university. There are very few undergrads, more grad students. Most of the companies are from the uh, uh, Stanford is from the graduate student, PhD student. So we should focus more on the research. I think that's the important uh, thing. Did I answer to your question? Yeah, let's explain our phenomena in Indonesia, especially in my university. So uh, okay. thank you. So, so, okay, so well, one more thing was 20 years ago, yes, Japan was focusing on like incubators mm -hmm. and supporting like uh, young uh, entrepreneurs. But those university incubators, I would, in my sense, didn't work very well. And it went okay. And I think there are a few reasons. Well, I mean, 
By the way, in Japan, there are lots of the uh, young entrepreneurs, like a student undergrad entrepreneurs now, and they are doing fine. Uh, but you know, so supporting the uh, students entrepreneur is much easier than supporting the scientists, you know, scientific research and incubation. And in general, especially in Tokyo, their ecosystem outside of university. So when students have a good idea, they just can go to outside of university to get help. And university doesn't need to help. But for the science-based research, university needs to commit somehow. So that, that's why it's becoming more important, I would say, in that sense. Thank you, Professor Mo, for your explanation. So we have two questions from the participants. So from the first one, uh, Dr. Gancar, who should give and set the strategic research field in our university? Should it set top down university to university researcher or bottom up researchers to university? Should we go to business practice first to find the right topic for research? Then we go to journal first. Uh, okay, so it, it's difficult because a top down and the bottom up depends on the structure of university. So how much freedom of each department has is important. Let's say, like, uh, you know, Japanese universities are not good at uh, the, uh, not resilient, let's say. What I mean is when the, when the professors retires, most of the universities just hires the researchers in the same field. To, to fill the up the existing one. And that mechanism doesn't work. So we should always try to seek a new field which didn't exist before. That is, is being resilient to the new you know, research field. And if that mechanism is, uh, is incorporated by department level, I think the you know, bottom-up works. If, if, if that department independence is not uh, good enough, then top-down approach by you know top management of university is necessary, I would say. And then, so it's more like a, you know organizational structure is important rather than bottom up. You know, and then, then should we go to the business practice first or the finding the right topic of the researchers? According to the star scientist research, we always look at the research field first. We never think about business. What's interesting about all of the star scientists is that they did not start their research for business. They had a great research and the venture capitalists or like a external business people found their research interesting and they started a company. So research should be first, not the business. Okay, thank you, Professor Maki. Hope it uh, explained a lot about the uh, Dr. Ganjar question. Another uh, questions from our postgraduate students, Mr. Arif Yusuf. Dear Professor Maki, would you give some suggestion for increasing research quality, which can increase increasing quality of life for scientists and society? Thank you. Okay, so uh, could you elaborate uh, this question a little bit more? Can, can this uh, person- Mr. Arif, could you please uh, turn on your microphone? Quality of life means like, you know, what kind of, there are many answers for this, I think. So I want to- uh, You mean, uh, maybe we have to clarify what it is about the welfare of the scientists. Uh, Mr. Arif, could you please turn on your mic? Oh, you can put on the chat if, if you okay, want. Okay, sure. So- Welfare, yes. And the welfare of the, the, I mean, the remuneration probably for the scientists. Welfare of the scientists, is that the question? Yes. So, according to him, yes. So how can we increase the welfare of the scientists in the country? Is that what you're trying to say? Is that true, is Mr. Arif? Yes, about welfare and for the society. Okay, so I, I'm not sure if I'm answering this uh, correctly. So maybe if, 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 if you're misleading, just please add some more questions uh, more. But so, so what, what's happening, you know, 
so we, we, so I have uh, both experience in Japan and the US and you know scientists you know in Japan it's much much less attractive job than compared to the US in many ways well, one is the payment it's so low right it's not competitive at all so like it's more like becoming like a social mission and in the US you know, there's a more like a market mechanism of the recruiting the like best scientists with a high salary, right? So th actually that is a, a increasing uh, the uh, welfare of, you know, of researchers. But, you know, a, a startup itself, creating a business is in a way, it's a good, uh, it's a good way to increase the welfare of the researchers. For two, re two reasons. One is getting more opportunity to get paid outside of university, right? So th that's a good way to increase the welfare. I mean, the, the payment itself. And also, oh yeah, one more thing this is interesting is that when we look at the star scientists, especially in the US and probably in Japan as well, star scientists. as well. Okay, that's also a good way to, you know, increase the happiness of researchers, you know, because they are making their research usable and you know, they feel they can feel that they are contributing to the society. I'm not sure if I answered you in the right way. Is that what you were trying to ask? Yes, Professor. Okay, I hope it was not misleading as answer. Okay, great. Probably one more, uh, one last question. Or, sorry, one last question. So Prof Maki, I have uh, probably like, uh, I want to confirm uh, all of the current studies is based on clarified, clarified uh, database, am I right? Yeah, and so, we all of quantitative research. So yes. most of the Indonesian university uh, rely on the CIFAL data set. Uh, can we like uh, replicate same concept framework to uh, with the use of CIFAL data set from the scopus? Uh, so we decided to use like a web of science for this uh, data set uh, for like uh, several reasons. And yes, you can replicate using Scopus but the, the, the journals covered between the Scopus and the Web of Science is uh, like a slightly different. Let's say 20% are different. So we cannot perfectly replicate, but you know, we, we can do very similar things. And we are looking for the you know, co uh, collaboration with uh, researchers in other countries. So if you could contact us, you know, we could, and as long as we become like a co-author or like a cite our papers, we are happy to provide you some of the list that we have to some of the researchers. I think this would be a, a research topic or research opportunity for some of us, for the college, for the graduate student as well. Okay, so if you can be the co-author uh, co or like a collaborative, you know, yes. researchers with our project, we are happy to provide the data set. Okay. Especially Thank the list. That's much easier Before. than replicating, right? So I think that will be our last questions. And thank you so much for uh, your time availability. Uh, it is an honor to have you here. Maybe you have some uh, specific last uh, personal statement for us as the audience. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So uh, one is my email address is in last Slide, and I will share the PDF uh, to, uh, through organizer to everybody. Yeah. And I'm yeah. always happy to collaborate with you know people in different countries, especially the star scientist phenomena. We need a global, you know, uh, international comparison. So I look forward to uh, to working with uh, you as a researchers as well as you know. Um, in many ways, and uh, as I said before, the session starts to some of our members. 
uh, you know, my grandfather used to live in Jakarta for like very long time ago. And I've been passionate with, uh, you know, working with uh, people in Indonesia, which I never been yet. So after COVID, I'm eager to visit. And one of my current students I supervise is from Indonesia as well. So I feel like uh, very, this is a great opportunity. This is not the end of our collaboration, but the start of our collaboration. So I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Professor Marxing. We do apologize as uh, the moderator of the organization. We have some uh, inconvenience to cause. So yeah, maybe we will collaborate more. And uh, next year, probably we can propose another uh, topic or research agenda with you. Uh, as as uh, the the team leader probably. Thank you very much. But this this was a great opportunity for me. Thank you for having me. Thank you, and we will send later uh, for the, for all the audience. We will send the record, video recording and uh, as well as the presentation material after uh, Prof. Maki delivered it to us. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Professor Maki, and I hope you all uh, all the participants and the professionality you. Um, Stay healthy wherever you are. Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, we will see you again in the next uh, agenda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Maki. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye.